afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. As we close out another week, it's time for our Flashback Friday program. Today we'll be taking a unique trip underground and we'll be looking back at Vermont's first commercial cranberry harvest. We're going to start in the town of Danby where people come from all over the world to buy Vermont marble. The marble quarry in Danby is closed to the public, but nearly 30 years ago, Across the Fence got a special tour of the quarry. Here's Lynn Jarvis. We descended one mile into Danby Mountain, 500 feet below the Earth's surface. We traveled into the mine and along the way, our guide Tommy Westcott explained how marble is mined. The pictures that you see don't begin to show the vastness of these underground chambers first quarried over a century ago. Even more amazing was being surrounded by walls of shining white Danby marble, waiting for future generations of miners. It is like being in an underground cathedral. And after about 15 minutes, we've arrived down in the depths of the earth where Tommy and the crew is actually working right now to bring this marble out of Danby Mountain. And Tommy, I'm just amazed at the quality of this marble. You wouldn't think it would look this beautiful way down in here, would you? No, you wouldn't. It's, it's hard to explain. Yes, it is. It's a marvel of nature. Now, what we're standing on now is the next piece of marble that will be taken out of here. And Tommy, there's a machine here that helps take this out or cut it. That, what is this there? We drill our holes with that, uh, basically, so uh, you can run the wire to cut this huge chunk out. So that's a drill, uh -huh. and you come along this green line and make some holes for right. the wire that cuts it out. Now, once this piece is, is cut, what happens to it? We uh, put peach stone underneath, we drill a hole in the top, we uh, set a big pin, and we run a long lead rope that goes to a 560 bucket loader, mm -hmm. and we pull it right over, and it lands right on the peach stone. It must hit with a thud. Yes, it does. Because this weighs as much as 300 tons. Yes. Once it gets on the peach stone, do you drag it out intact, or do you cut it up? We have to cut it up right there. And that's what's done with it then? Uh, Mike Blair comes down and he measures up the size of the block and uh, we cut it wherever he, wherever he orders for. And then you haul it out? Yeah, then they have, the forklift comes down in and takes it out. And we, it's stored where we started out up there in the, in the, in the field, the big block. Right, yes it is. And tra trailer trucks come in and take it on. Right. Tommy, you've been here 26 years coming in here every day. Right. What's it like? Well, it's it's kind of kind of a nice nice day, you know. It's uh, the atmosphere's nice uh, until you go out the door, like in the summer or winter. It's, you know, <laughs> it's different. But you know, down here, you have no idea if it's snowing. Really, ninety degrees. You have it's, no it's a it's a kind of a peaceful atmosphere down yes, here today. It it's it's quite uh, different. It's my first experience being in a quarry. I really enjoyed it, Tommy. Thank you for the tour. You're welcome quite a ride. Our next segment comes from 2002. That's when Across the Fence visited with Vermont's first commercial cranberry grower. Will Michael has the story. From a distance, it looks like Bob Lesnikowski is simply mowing the lawn. But a closer look shows he's harvesting his fall crop. This is a bed of cranberries. We believe Vermont's first commercial cranberry bed. Lesnikowski started his cranberry operation in the hills of Fletcher, Vermont, seven years ago. I was a logger for a long period of time. I was looking for, uh, looking to do something with the land that we own for a, a while uh, that would be here for a while, and also that was a, a unique agricultural product in Vermont. With the goal of it being a profitable venture, which you know you hear a lot about sustainable agriculture. Um, and people always just think of the sustainability from a low chemical input end of things. Um, small agriculture, most people consider sustainable agriculture, but if the enterprise isn't profitable, there's no way it can be sustainable. And also, if the lifestyle is so miserable that our children don't want to do it, that enterprise is not going to be sustainable. So it all has to come together on that. With years of trial and error behind him, Lesnikowski is now looking to expand his two-acre site into a six to ten-acre operation. 
What's your market model? A lot of our market uh, is uh, fresh market sales. Uh, most of the crop right now goes to Boyden Valley Winery for wine sales, and we also do some specialty food products in restaurant sales. We're to the point where restaurants are calling us this time of year to say when the cranberries going to be ready. But they also, I had a, I spoke with a chef this morning and says, you know, you need to send us down some, uh, some information because people don't believe there's cranberries grown in Vermont. What about the market worldwide? There is a lot of cranberries, um, but we kind of stay out of the whole commodity end of things because we grow a unique Vermont product and I think people really like to buy Vermont products. Could you market or sell more if you had more? Definitely, yeah. Um, as far as what the ultimate, how much can be sold, it's a little hard to say. Um, you know, we run out of cranberries every year. Um, I guess we'll, I'll be like every other farmer, we'll keep growing cranberries till we don't run out every year. <laughs> but could you be doing twice as much business, do you think? Probably, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it, Chefs like it because it is a unique Vermont product um, that, you know, I'll admit it, they do pay a premium for it. Although there is currently a glut of cranberries nationwide, the tiny red fruit has been with us for generations, especially during the holidays. The folklore in, in America and the truth in America is, of course, that it was um, cranberries were, were supplied on that first Thanksgiving. And ever since then, it's been an icon of, of American culinary arts, you know, from the lowly relishes and, and sauces and, and starting in the 1960s with the introduction of uh, cranberry into juices. And uh, it's very, it considered very healthful. And uh, it's got this, like I said, this thing about it which, which puts it right in the center of Americana. Cranberries were started to be a commercial crop um, after the, the Revolutionary War really kicked in after the Civil War, but it's always been, had always been, a very seasonal crop. It was, it was harvested in the fall, September, October, consumed over the winter, and uh, then as Thanksgiving became a much more important holiday, it was almost, you know, almost exclusively eaten Thanksgiving time and Christmas time. And then uh, Ocean Spray, which was established in the 1920s as a farmer's cooperative, uh, in the 1950s and 60s developed, they said, hey, we've got to do something different than just produce relishes and sauces for one or two holidays a year, and they developed juices. And now juices account probably for 90% of the, of the market for cranberries. Lesnikowski doesn't plan to challenge ocean spray, but he has established a viable Vermont agricultural operation. We're a specialty market. Um, we have the Vermont seal of quality, um, and you know our customers are looking to buy a locally produced product. Um, I really feel people will will support local agriculture if they're given the chance. In Fletcher, Vermont, I'm Will Michael with Across the Fence. Well, it's now been nearly 20 years since the launch of the Vermont Cranberry Company. It's expanded to five cranberry beds and an array of products, and it remains the only commercial cranberry grower in the state. Our final flashback segment today involves the heating season and using Vermont's own renewable energy. Keith Silva has more on that. All winter long, Vermont foresters and loggers are working the woods to provide the highest grade wood products. Okay, save that one because it might be worth $2,000. That one tree right. might be worth one day. At this site in Pomfret, these trees also have a more practical and more vital use, energy. In this case here, it was uh, mostly low-valued um, pines and poplars, which were um, deformed and the only place we could market them is in the chipping industry. What whole tree chipping is, is we utilize the whole tree. We harvest the trees out here in the woods, we bring them to the landing. We usually have a slasher set up beside of this and saw out the good logs. We take out the good logs for lumber. There's a big pile of chipwood right behind us here. This is used for biomass 
to make electricity. It's a constant renewable resource that's gonna keep us warm. This, this is going into electrical plant and some of them are going into heating systems for schools and um, state office buildings. We want as many of these chips as possible to come from Vermont. Kathy Hilgendorf is the school construction coordinator for the Vermont Department of Education. The department is responsible for implementing state legislation that provides incentives to school districts that utilize renewable energy resources. It's really a cooperative effort of a lot of people to assure that this um, program remains um, profitable for for those who are involved in it to make a living and also a great deal for school districts and the taxpayers who support them. The State Board of Education rules that govern um, the eligibility of construction projects for state assistance, financial assistance, require that energy projects such as heating systems um, pass a life cycle cost test they must be life cycle cost effective in order to qualify for this state aid. Ultimately, the state's um, aid on this, the, the financial assistance that the state offers, is still coming from the taxpayers, um, be it the local taxpayers or, or through the statewide tax system. And we want to make sure that these systems are cost effective overall, not just the net local share and and they are this is a lot less work than my wood stove for sure norm torville is in charge of maintaining the wood chip boiler at champlain valley union high school the massive storage bin holds 40 tons of wood chips the chips are then augered onto a series of conveyor belts and into the furnace the furnace burns at approximately 2,000 degrees Forced air ensures that the chips burn completely. The result of a week's worth of burning fits into a 20-gallon trash can. I get about one barrel full for every 20 tons or tractor trailer truck load of chips. Actually, this barrel here is only three quarters full and I got that after nine days of burning. The chips that CVU burns are from hardwood trees, which also helps to reduce the amount of soot. There's no bark, there's no garbage, they're all chipped to a uniform size. Um, I had one guy come up, talk to me, he said, so these are like the, what's called the fine wine of chips. Kurt, what's the square footage here? It's 220,000 square feet. Kurt Prue is the director of maintenance at CVU. The wood chip boiler was only one part of an $18.4 million renovation at the school that was completed last fall. The cost of this boiler to the school district was just over $77,000. The total cost of the project was $500,000, which means the state of Vermont kicked in nearly $400,000 to bring this boiler online. Thanks to the new boiler, this is the first time in 14 years at CVU that Prue hasn't had to make regular calls for oil deliveries. Back in October, we topped the tank off and it's been sitting there ever since. Uh, fuel, we're burning probably 300, 350 gallons a day. Uh, today's cost between $1.60 and $1.75 a, a gallon. And now we're burning a load of wood chips a week at $650 a week. The only use now for the idle oil burners is as a backup system. The drawbacks to heating with wood are almost non-existent. Almost. Probably the biggest burden so far has been all the tours we've had to get of it, because everybody's so interested in the unit. Classrooms from, from CVU, from Mount Abraham, other people, other newspapers but it, it's, it's a beautiful system. Publicity and popularity aside, it's the bottom line that makes this system effective. Anything that could save these school districts money is good. As we know, education spending in Vermont is on everyone's mind and is something we're all trying to control. Um, we wanna be smart about the way we spend our money and the way we utilize our natural resources. And here is a, a great combination of that. We don't have any shortage of, of standing trees. We have a very good supply of wood in Vermont. We have a good climate for growing this, this, this stuff. So 
to be able to use it in our, our schools where we're also growing a wonderful resource is a pretty great thing. A renewable resource produced by Vermonters that serves all Vermont's resources, today and tomorrow. In Hinesburg, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thank you, Keith, and thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.